positive use services uh, for uh, the community. So, uh, what is Positive East? Positive East is uh, London's, London's largest community based HIV charity, and we provide free services to people living with HIV who either live or access HIV care in East London. These services include peer support, counseling, group activities, and welfare and benefits advice. Um, we also provide free HIV and STI testing and sexual health advice to people uh, across East London. Our services are still uh, working. We just had to uh, transition them online. So if you are interested to access our services, you can uh, go on our website, uh, www.positiveeast.com org.uk and you can access all of a range of, uh, of um, the services. The testing of course is not possible to uh, carry it on like face to face but uh, from tomorrow we are starting a new online uh, supported self-testing service. So if you want you can contact us and uh, we will get back to you and help you uh, perform on yourself an HIV rapid, uh, rapid test or an STI screening. Uh, just uh, go on our website and you will find all the information to book your, uh, your test. Uh, for STI screening, you can also go to uh, pe.shl.uk and you can uh, have a full STI screening sent to your home, or if you are if you need in, uh, if you are needing condoms, you can also go to the website freedom-shop.com and order uh, free condoms to get delivered anonymously uh, at your home. So uh, tonight, the film that uh, we ask you to watch is. Uh, the Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson. It's a very important documentary because um, it depicts the, uh, the life through the mystery uh, surrounding the death of this iconic, uh, sorry, <laughs> this iconic uh, character of uh, the LGBT movement. It's important uh, because uh, as a starter of the Stonewall riots and being the anniversary of the Stonewall riots uh, have just passed a couple of weeks ago, it's important to talk about this, but it's important to talk also about the fact of, of the importance of uh, trans and black LGBT uh, individuals in the fight for, uh, for the rights of the whole LGBT community. And this is uh, why we have here um, two uh, important activists like uh, Mark Thompson from uh, the Love Chat, the, the Love Tank, sorry, uh, and uh, Prepster and Blackout UK and uh, Kevin Mitchell from Spectra Trans Services. So um, we are here to have a chat with them and to talk about uh, the film and what are uh, the inequalities faced by uh, uh, these communities in the LGBT community at large. So, uh, so we start with Kevin. Hi, Kevin. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks. How are you? Fine, thanks. So, Kevin, uh, can you tell us something about yourself and uh, the work you do with uh, Spectral Fund Services? Sure. Um, I'm Kevin. I use he and they pronouns. And I work with Spectra um, as part of their trans empowerment program, which offers peer mentoring, trans counselling and social groups, um, which is predominantly my remit, um, the weekly groups. 
um, I'm also a part-time PhD student, so I'm um, looking at the intersections of stigma of social experience um, between disability and transgender identity, um, as I am a trans person with a visual impairment. Hmm. That's very interesting. So uh, what I wanted to ask you is, um, in the documentary, we see uh, many trans individuals like Marsha being treated as something then less, less than human. And this has clear repercussions on their mental health and personal safety. And lately we saw that our government has scrapped the Gender Recognition Act consultation. And I wanted to ask, to ask you, uh, in this light, uh, this scrapping this important document, what, what do you think the repercussions on uh, the life of trans individuals will be? So um, with the GRA, if it's pushed back, it will remove quite a lot of rights and have a significant impact on the trans community. Um, so at the moment, the GRA um, allows trans people to change their birth certificate um, after certain hurdles. And if that is amended or adapted in a negative way, um, then that means that people would really struggle to get access to the healthcare that they need um, to live authentically as the, themselves and to even access certain spaces such as public toilets um, and changing rooms. But what that would mean for the wider society is that if we had something like a controversial bathroom bill that took away um, a trans person's right to use the bathroom, which they um, believe best fits their gender, um, it would lead to sex stereotyping, which would impact cisgendered people as well. And I think in light of what's what's been ha happening with the GRA, um, it also kind of sparks thoughts back to the movie of how life used to be for trans people living underground and not being able to fully exist authentically, which is what trans people are trying to do. Um, and I think one of the main hangups about the GRA is looking at youth and trans youth. Um, and if, you know, for a lot of people, that's the mor moral panic here, is that we're letting children transition from an early age. But if you look at what trans children are able to do, they're able to self-identify and socially transition. They're not able to medically transition. And I think that's what people often find as the sticking point. But drawing back to the movie and um, Marsha P. Johnson and her life, she stepped out and stood up for what she believed in and was the starting point of Stonewall and LGBT rights, which is for the whole of the LGBT community. And I think what's important now is for the LGBT community to stand together because what's, what you can see happening with the GRA is that the government or wider society are trying to play different parts of the LGBT community off against each other because dividing us is the best way to, you know, to push us back. But I think if everyone stands together, then moving forward, we can exist in a better way. And what trans people want isn't, you know, rights above anyone else. It's just to exist on an equal platform. Um, so that's that's kind of my answer to that question is that it is having a significant impact, um, especially, you know, mental health. As soon as essentially what is happening at the moment is that trans existence is being attacked. And that's not what, you know, not what anyone wants to happen. And of course, it will impact on anyone's mental health if one part of their identity is targeted. Yeah, that's true. And also, if we think about it, uh, a lot of the uh, of the uh, rights that we have uh, now as an LGBT community come from those uh, riots uh, at Stonewall. 
So basically, if the uh, LGBT community has this right, it's owed in a, a greater part to uh, trans black women uh, who decided that they had enough and uh, and decided to f to fight back. So I think the least that we can do as a community is to stand uh, on the side of uh, trans people now that. Uh, they need the help of, of of the whole community. I think. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin, for your uh, very insightful uh, uh, talk. So let's uh, go to uh, Mark. Hi, Mark. Um, can you um, tell us about a bit about yourself and your activism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. So I'm Mark Thompson. Um, as Massimo says, I am the director of the Love Tank. And the Love Tank is a community kind of movement and organization which was set up to support Prepster, which some of you may have heard of. And the aims of both of the organizations is to what we kind of call refueling the community. So putting our energy, our resource and our time back into meeting the needs of those parts of our communities that are the most marginalized, those that have the poorest health outcomes and poor access to information, resources and services. Um, so that's what we've been doing and Prepster has been working around educating and agitating for PrEP for about five years. The other part of my work is um, I'm one of the co-founders of Blackout UK and we were set up to provide a digital and social space for black queer men in the UK um, to tell, store, tell our stories and provide what we describe as evidence of our existence. So those are a couple of the things that I do. Amazing. I, I'm a great fan of your work, Mark. Yeah. So what I wanted to ask is, um, we see in the, in the documentary that three of the uh, protagonists Marsha herself, uh, the Veronica Cruz, the trans woman that, is, that investigates about the death of Marsha, and uh, Islan Nettles, which is uh, the other trans uh, individual that has been murdered by a guy who pleads for panic defense, mm. uh, are all trans women of color. And uh, there are the st statistics in this country that say that queer people of, of color in this country as well are more likely to experience mental health and personal safety issues. Mm. So I wanted to ask you, uh, could you tell us more about the inequalities that uh, people of color face and uh, about the intersection uh, uh, between being LGBT and being uh, a person of color? Mm -hmm. Thanks. I mean, it's a great question. It's a, it's a really big question. So I'll, I'll try to, to, to answer what I can in, in a short space of time. I think one of the most important things to remember is that word intersectionality. And queer people of colour straddle those two worlds of being disproportionately of being queer and being people of colour. And what we know is that both of those groups are disproportionately affected by poor health, poor health, health outcomes, higher drug and alcohol use, poor mental health, poor housing, poverty, etc. So when those two things meet, it's no surprise that homophobia and racism, transphobia and sexism will all come together to, to create a really heady mess. And I think as we've seen with COVID-19 recently and the impact of Vite, sorry, there's my dog, <laughs> And the impact of um, COVID-19 and disproportionate impact of HIV in black gay male communities, that these things happen. So we have to go right back and look at the impact of structural racism and the role that that plays in exacerbating health inequalities and things like COVID make those things even worse. So until we start to dismantle white supremacy, structural racism, inter um, institutionalized racism, all of these things which impact on lives, then we can't really start to manage the small micro things which happen to us on a daily basis. I think what's really troubling and, and kind of drawing it back to the film is that if we look at the really, really terrible things that are happening to trans communities of color globally, the huge murder rate of, of trans women in the US, 
um, violent attacks that are happening here. Where does that come from? And there's some conversation around it being you know, individuals, but we have to understand that those individuals who are, who are committing those acts of violence are the products of a system as well. So that needs to be unpicked. So there's a lot of work to do and a lot of conversations to be had, but this is historical and we can link it, what's happened today, right back to what happened to Marsha. Yeah, yeah, I totally I agree. And yeah, thank you for the very in, uh, insightful uh, uh, food for thought. <laughs> So tonight we also invited uh, Ferhan Khan, who was um, who is um, a Muslim uh, non-binary activist, but unfortunately he couldn't uh, make it. So he sent he sent me a few lines uh, that I will read uh, to you. I I wanted to ask him about. Um, the inequalities faced by um, Muslim LGBTQ people, uh, especially uh, from uh, South Asian descent. And uh, this is what he wrote for us. So uh, my activism centers around bringing greater visibility to LGBTQIA plus identifying Muslim, Muslims in particular. I believe this is important because Muslims that are LGBTQIA+, identifying, uh, identifying are often invalidated on, the, on their identity and made to feel ashamed of who they are. They are told that being anything other than cisgender and straight is against Islam, but there's no evidence that this is the case, at least not in the Quran. There are homophobic hadiths but these are oral transcriptions from after the prophet Muhammad. Uh, and uh, can't always be relied upon. I recently took part in a film called Pride in Protest, where I challenged protesters that gathered outside of primary school in Birmingham, primary schools in Birmingham. Sorry for my English tonight. <laughs> they were protesting against LGBTQIA plus relationship education entering the school curriculum, which is being mandated by law this year. The protesters were predominantly from the Muslim community, and I wanted to show that gay Muslims, such as myself, do indeed exist and struggle with homophobic attitudes. There was also an incident at Waltham Forest Pride where unfortunately a woman of Muslim heritage that wore a full length burqa decided to proclaim deeply offensive and homophobic statements at the March participants. She called the participants of Pride despicable people. Fortunately, the woman was able to be identified. I'm assuming by other people that recognized their voice and behavior and was arrested and charged. Her actions had no place in our community here in Waltham Forest, and I am glad she was charged. I would, however, like to say that as a Muslim woman, she probably faces multiple intersections of oppression herself. And I believe she may have acted in the way that she did in order to gain some semblance of power in a life which she feels powerless. As a Muslim woman wearing a burqa, I believe she has been reined in and oppressed, reined in and oppressed by misogyny. It's a sad fact of life that sometimes the oppressed seek to oppress others that they believe are a couple of ranks below them on the hierarchy of oppression. She probably enjoyed the fleeting moment of power she believed she'd had when proclaiming her hateful words. And she probably thought she could get away with what she did due to her face being concealed by the burqa. I hope that her arrest will send a clear message to anyone, to anyone else that considers doing the same, that the hate crime will not be tolerated. So these are Ferhan words. I, um, it's uh, a, a really uh, important message, I think. And also, uh, the LGBT Muslim community needs uh, a lot of uh, support in the moment, I think. So 
that's why I wanted to include him today, but hopefully we will have him in another occasion to talking about his uh, uh, documentary, the documentary where, he, where he's in, which is very interested and he was in the uh, BFI flare, uh, the last one that was cancelled. So hopefully we will, we will be able to watch it together with him. So um, after that, uh, I remember that talking uh, in an exchange of emails with uh, Mark, we were uh, reflecting on the, on the fact that uh, queer documentaries are uh, important for our communities because it's basically the, uh, the only medium we have to get in touch with our history. Uh, so uh, I was thinking that actually, yes, uh, I was thinking um, the other day uh, that uh, in, in the 90s, I was, wa I was watching this documentary called um, We Were Marked with a Big A about the um, gay, uh, gay men who were uh, in the concentration camp, in the Nazi concentration camp during the Second World War. And I remember that at the time was, I was completely shocked because in the uh, history books that I was studying, there was plenty of uh, talking about uh, Jewish being interned in this uh, uh, concentration camp, but there was no mention of of gay people and the things that they went through. And the documentary was really shocking. And it was the only thing that uh, put me in contact with that. So I think that that's the case with most of the um, LGBTQ history. Uh, we don't have it in books, like in his official history books or uh, we don't often see it on television. So the uh, documentaries are basically uh, the only thing we have to, uh, to get in contact with our origins and with our roots. So uh, on Mark's suggestion, I, I would like to have around uh, among us and talk about uh, the uh, one of the um, uh, documentaries that you watch that it, uh, you think it's uh, important that people watch it and uh, why is that? So uh, I will start with Mark since <laughs> you proposed this and I think it's a very good uh, uh, question. Thank you. I mean, I, I first of all, I mean, I, I love films, I love documentaries, so this is really really challenging and I totally agree with you Massimo that documentaries queer documentaries give us an opportunity to to look back on our past um to think about where we've been and where we're going there are some great documentaries there's also some really good contemporary documentaries which tell us about life now and it was really difficult for me to, to, to kind of pick one of my favorites so just indulge me um I think there are three that people should definitely see there's a trilogy that I always recommend and I think I also have to put context that a lot of the stuff that I've watched um, is around the AIDS epidemic as well, because I think it's a story which is told very, very often. So the three for me are definitely gay sex in the 70s, we were here, and ha uh, how to survive a plague. Because I think what those three documentaries give us, it's very US, it's very white, it's very cisgendered male, but it gives us a narrative of the HIV epidemic from the US from the mid 70s up until the early 90s. So I would definitely always recommend those. But if I was to go on a desert island and they said you could only have one documentary, it doesn't matter if it's queer, would be Paris is Burning. It's a really obvious choice, um, but I saw it when it was shown on Arena on BBC Two back in 1990 before Madonna did Vogue or anything like that. And I would fight anybody that would say to me, it's not the most important and influential queer documentary and I think in some ways the most influential documentary of all time simply because of the narrative that it tells but the way that it has bled into popular culture so you cannot get on the bus without a 14 year old girl going yes queen right so that comes from Paris is burning which obviously it comes from RuPaul's Drag Race 
But I think the fact that it told the narrative story of young queer trans and cis folk in New York that were living in poverty, that created a culture which we still celebrate today is for me the most powerful. But it's also quite problematic because the filmmaker was a, was a lesbian white lady who kind of went in. And so there's questions around who shapes the narrative as well. So I would always go Paris is Burning. I love it, I can quote it, and it's also a lot of fun. So yeah, that's my choice. And Paris is Burning is also the base for the, for Paul, for the- It is, for yeah. The award winning series, which was fantastic as well. Yeah. And uh, you read my, my mind, Mark, because in September we will be, uh, having Paris is Burning for the, for the film night. And we will have uh, Darrell from House of Khan talking oh, about- Oh, fantastic. Good, <laughs> good Talking point. about uh, the documentary. So that will be a, a really great one if people can watch out. I'll join, I'll and, join you for that. Yeah, definitely. You're always welcome. And Kevin, so what's your choice? <laughs> um, so my choice would be Disclosure, um, which is a recent addition, um, because I think one of the best things that happens with documentaries is that you see actually the impact, particularly the social impact of things, um, because, you know, research does tell us that the best way to change attitudes is through social interaction it's through getting to know people and it's through being able to be empathetic to other people's identities experiences um and how you know how they live um so i i definitely choose disclosure because it it will just shows the um the impact of and the issues that go along with trans lives um and there are many <laughs> But just to have, um, just to have like a snapshot of actually what is going on, what has happened, how it's happened, why it's happened, and what what people can learn from that, and how people can move forward from that, and that's one of the most important things that documentaries give us. Exactly, and also, oh, we have to say that uh, if uh, LGBT documentaries, uh, if Queer documentaries are rare. Uh, documentaries on uh, trans people are even rarer. So I think wherever, whenever we have the opportunity to learn more about our uh, trans siblings, it's always uh, it's always good. And I watched Disclosure. It's it's really good. It's really uh, eye opening and uh, interesting. So thank you for the choice, Kevin. <laughs> So uh, we are at the moment Asma, where we... Asma, sorry, I just, want, yes. I just want to say really quickly that, I mean, I watched Disclosure as well a couple of weeks ago and I completely agree. But I think what really struck me, and I think this is really important, is that very often, and particularly around communities within our communities, that when the, when the narrative is very often told, it comes from a place of um, voyeurism or it comes as a place of these lives are really, really terrible and really bad. And I think one of the things I loved about Disclosure as well as learning so much um, was I came away, there was, a, there was an element of celebration. There was an element of, you know, we are, we are really proud people. And not only are you learning, there's some really beautiful stuff here that you should take on board. And I came away transformed. So I think documentary has a power to celebrate as well as, as to raise really big social issues for us. Yeah, yeah, I I completely agree. It's really uh, they are important, I think, uh, uh, especially for our community. And it's always good to have uh, a new insight on things and seeing things from the perspective of uh, people who is actually uh, living them uh, at the moment. I think it's yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, so thank you guys. Let's see if um, Ricky has some questions from the from our viewers from the. Hey everyone! It, no, sorry, Hi, there's, there's, there's no question. 
no question. No question from the viewers, no. Okay, so I think uh, if uh, you guys don't want to add any anything else, this is uh, this is all. I hope it was interesting for everybody. I would just like to uh, repeat again that uh, tomorrow uh, we are starting our online uh, assisted self testing service. So uh, if you need an HIV or STI uh, screening and you are uh, not uh, confident to do it on your own, you can always contact us and we will guide you to the pro through the process as best as we can. So uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Ricky, for, uh, for uh, doing this with us. And uh, the next film will be Rafiki, uh, a lesbian movie from, uh, from Kenya. And we will have uh, some lesbian uh, black African activists uh, talking uh, with us about the film. And for that time, me and Ricky will take a break and we will leave the, uh, the film night in the, uh, in the hands of our lovely, uh, lady colleagues of the prevention team. So uh, it will be Yasmin, uh, Beatrice Nabulia, and uh, Gloria Odongo who will be uh, leading on this and uh, creating a special night for, uh, for our uh, lesbian friends. So have a nice evening and thank you for, for being here. Bye.